Hey everyone, this is Eric Archer from Texas Instruments and tonight's uh, Q&A session on these smart space videos uh, is with Jessica Cahoot. Hey Jessica, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great, I'm great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and going over uh, some of the videos that were done. Um, and, and before we get started, everybody uh, watching this video right now, if you would, please participate in the chat and let us know where you're calling in from. and uh, also, tell us what your favorite topic in biology is, and uh, we may respond to a few of those and uh, here in a little while. Uh, so a uh, little bit of background information. So Jessica did a uh, series of videos uh, not so long ago in our Smart Space video series, and those videos covered topics like cellular respiration, uh, biodiversity, and uh, population dynamics. Um, Jessica, can you tell us a little bit about uh, where you're, you know, where you're teaching currently, um, and uh, what's going on? You know, what's going on with your school and your students? I know a lot of teachers out there. Some of them are in person, some of them are virtual. Uh, what's going on with your in, in your situation? Sure. Um, well, first, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, I teach um, in a high school, Reservoir High School in Howard County, Maryland. So it's Central Maryland, kind of a suburb of DC and Baltimore. Um, and our district is currently virtual right now, 100% virtual, and will be for the first semester. Um, and so we made some modifications to the schedule this year. Um, we moved to a four by four schedule. So the students will have four classes in the fall and four different classes in the spring um, will be, we have some synchronous and asynchronous time with the students. So four days a week, we'll use Google Meets to meet with the students um, to instruct and then assign some asynchronous work for them to do outside of that time. So it's been quite the transition. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a very different way of teaching, um, but this is our fifth week of doing it. And it's, it's, I feel like I'm finally kind of getting getting in the groove. Mm -hmm. uh, from your experience, how, how do you think the students are responding to this sort of new way of teaching? I think they're, they're okay with it for the most part. I think they would prefer to be in school as most of us would as well. Um, so some are adjusting better than others. Um, but, you know, I think most are just making the best of it and doing what they can, um, but you know, it's, it's, I feel bad for my seniors because this is not how your senior year was envisioned at all. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I yeah, I know, um, yeah, a lot of seniors in high school, I'm sure they're probably hoping that they can still do, you know, homecoming and, and prom and, and, you know, all the sort of things that go along with the traditional senior year. Boy, I hope, I hope you know, they're able to, uh, get some of that stuff back. Yeah, well, college applications and letters of recommendations and SATs mm -hmm. are still going on. So yeah, I know that's right. still stressing out some of my seniors. <laughs> yeah, I bet that is, yeah. And, and yeah, it's just a, uh, it's, it's a year like no other, that's for sure. Um, well, uh, so in this virtual environment, you know, you as a science teacher, um, I know most science teachers participate or have the students participate in some kind of lab or hands-on uh, type activity. Uh, you know, can you speak to how your students are, are, are handling those kinds of things, what you're doing as a teacher to, to do, do what's available, do what you can to provide those experiences for the students? Yeah, it's been very difficult to kind of take what I've usually done in the classroom and transfer it to a virtual setting. Um, there's a lot of projects that I used to do that I really can't do in a virtual setting that is kind of difficult to part with. Um, so I've been trying to be creative with some of the ideas um, and take bits and pieces, um, at least some of the essence of some of the things that I've done um, and try to lead it into a virtual setting. So with labs, it's, you know, I do a lot of, I used to do a lot of data collection where students would use probes and collect data with those probes and then make sense of it. But we can't really do any hands-on stuff right now. So I've been trying to record me doing the labs <laughs> and then sharing the data with them. So they can do at least the part of analyzing the data and making sense of it. So we're still getting part of it um, and they're still working with the data um, 
it's not, I'm sure it's not as great of them watching me versus them doing it themselves, <laughs> but it, it at least gives them the idea of how science works. And yeah, so that's, I mean, you know, it, it, that's about as well as you can do in, 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 in the current situation we're in. And I know uh, the three videos that, that we shot, um, <clears throat> I guess it was last month, uh, you did a lot of hands-on things in those videos. And, and I know uh, talking with you before, you mentioned that uh, um, you're going to use um, some of those videos with this group of students that you have uh, this year. Um, can you talk about one of those videos a little bit about uh, uh, how you're going to use it with them? I think, um, was it the dichotomous key that you were, you were uh, talking about using? Well, the, that was our, yeah. So with the biodiversity um, video, we went to the stream to collect samples. So there's a program that we do with our freshmen. So both our earth science and our bio GT, that's our first year course for students entering science. So they're either in earth science Earth and Space Science or BioGT, and all ninth graders get the experience in our district of going out to the stream and collecting data on our watershed. And so we went out this summer knowing that we couldn't get all of our students out there. So we videotaped us collecting the water quality test, collecting macroinvertebrates, which are little tiny critters that live on the bottom of the stream bed. And one, that's one of the, my favorite experiences with my freshmen is taking them out there and seeing the kids get very excited about doing science in the field. And so I wanted to make a video to kind of show what we do and what we did and what we can learn from it. And so I used some of the video footage from the stream, some of the pictures of the macroinvertebrates that we collected, um, which is, fun just to get out there, get wet. Um, it's always fun to see the students that might be a little skittish about some of the, the macroinvertebrates and be like, I'm not touching them, I'm not touching them. I'm like, it's okay, you can just help out. And like by the end of the end of the experience, they're in there like waist deep practically, just diving in um, and just enjoying it. And so we use the dichotomous keys to figure what they are because they're, these critters are, you know, they're very strange looking to many students because, you know, they're, they're the larvae stage of flies like mayflies and caddisflies and even dragonflies. Like kids know what a dragonfly looks like, but may have never seen a dragonfly larvae. Um, and it's a really cool experience for them to go out and touch and see it. So instead of them going out and touching and seeing it, they'll have a video with a picture. <laughs> Um, and just get the, get the experience of using a dichotomous key to figure out what these things are. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that video because uh, you had <clears throat> images of you and your family <laughs> in, the, uh, in the stream uh, collecting, you know, the critters at the, you know, uh, you know, at the, uh, you know, at the um, soil level. And, 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 and what was neat to me is you're right. I mean, a lot of the, uh, the morphology of, of these these creatures is very different in the larval stage versus you know their adult stage and um, and then going through that dichotomous key trying to figure out what is what um, pretty amazing stuff and the fact that all of those that variety of, of um, you know the, the, the variety of all of those different animals living in the same kind of space and, and not that large of an area to me is it's pretty amazing. And so, yeah, having the kids be able to, they can't experience it this year because of, you know, restrictions due to COVID. Uh, the best next thing is being able to at least show it to them and, and explain it to them. And just even the pictures of some of those things, you did a good job in the video of using like, I think you had maybe like a penny or some mm -hmm. scale reference that the kids could see that this thing is tiny. It's really yeah, they're very tiny and they'll go out there with um, paint brushes to like, scrape off rocks in order to get um, the, the macroinvertebrates off. And the, the organi organization that we work with is the um, Howard County Conservancy in, 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 Mar in, well, Howard County. And they've built a partnership with, the, with our Howard County Public Schools to build this watershed report card. And their volunteers are fantastic. And they've set all that up for us. We just show up we do our work and they help compile all the data. 
The kids get to even present to elected officials in the spring to say, hey, this is, this is the current quality of our streams and schoolyard. These are our recommendations on how to make it better. Um, and so it really gives them a voice in their own community. And it's just a fantastic program that we've been doing for, I think this is the seventh year. Um, yeah, and I even roped my own children since I couldn't bring my students. So my 11 and eight year old were out there with me with dip nets trying to get some, <laughs> some of the macro invertebrates. So I put them to work. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, do they, uh, yeah, I bet, I bet your kids do, you know, enjoy being, you know, kids in, in your house getting, you know, being able to do those kinds of things and explore nature and, you know, just compare different critters uh, <laughs> to one another. So that's, it's not a bad gig if, if yeah. You're kids. <laughs> yeah, and they're used to it with a mom as a biology teacher. So like we'll go out and play in the yard and show them bugs that we collect. So that's not squirmish for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like here, boys, look at this thing I found. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet a lot of kids in your area and, and across the country are, you know, probably getting to know their own yards or own areas or own communities uh, much better now than they ever have before, just because there's so many you know, restrictions on what you, where you can go and what you can do, you know. I'm yeah, saying, absolutely. That's the hope. But it's, yeah, right. Well, that's true. Yeah, get them away from the uh, the television. And right. I, in the chat that uh, I guess some of your students have signed on and they're saying hello. Hello. <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. So, uh, so, okay. So that was the biodiversity video um, where, you know, where you guys were, were looking at, you uh, um, you know, different uh, organisms uh, in the in the stream and, and, and kind of comparing them to one another and trying to figure out which which one goes with what uh, species in the uh, dichotomous key. Um, you also did another one, cellular respiration. Can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, a little bit about cellular respiration and then how you went about doing this uh, this uh, smart space video? Well, if my students are on, they know that we talked about it today, um, even in my, <laughs> my on grade level biology class. So hopefully they'll be able to tell me a little bit about it too in the chat, maybe we'll see. Um, <laughs> That's a good <laughs> but idea. My AP kids, we're gonna be talking about it in about two weeks. Um, so right now we're on enzymes, we're gonna be doing photosynthesis next week and then cellular respiration the week following. So we're just flying <laughs> through the schedule because I'm teaching AP bio on a, a semester, schedule. So I have to be done by January 28th. And it's wow. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it's impressive. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to condense things and focus on the important skills to, you know, get them ready for the AP test in college biology. So we'll see how things go. Um, but with the video I created, because the summer when I was creating these videos, um, and even just the summer thinking about how I was going to approach virtual learning, knowing that that's what our district had decided, I was thinking of like, well, how am I going to give my students a lab experience? Um, so knowing that I could collect data, I could share that data with them, and then they could do something, make sense of it, is kind of where I started from. And so the cellular respiration video um, was one of my favorite labs, or it is one of my favorite labs, um, using germinating peas. So we germinate some peas and even try to get the germination process on video, doing like a time-lapse thing, um, <laughs> and then using the germinating peas versus non-germinating peas. And then in the classroom, they would set up different conditions, putting the germinating peas either, or germinating them in hot water versus cold water versus acid base, that kind of thing. And then they would measure um, using a carbon dioxide probe, how much carbon dioxide is produced, um, which is, using peas is always interest, interesting for many students because that's a misconception for many students is that only plants go through photosynthesis, not cellular respiration. So measuring carbon dioxide as the waste product during that process, um, we can see how the rate of respiration and measure the rate of respiration using those sensors. Um, and then by giving them that data, they can compare the rates between the different environments um, and look at what affects the rate of cellular respiration, which is always a, a fun lab. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, you addressed it just now, but uh, yeah, the, the, in the video, you, you would kind of address the misconception 
that a lot of people have, and probably not just students, adults as well, um, just about, you know, plants use photosynthesis, plants, you know, uh, consume carbon dioxide and, and expel oxygen. Well, yeah, that's true, you know, but, uh, but to get to that point, you know, they're, uh, you know, in the case of peas and other, other plant species, they're, they're starting off by, through germination, that process of germination where they're actually using cellular respiration. Uh, kind of like, you know, animals do, um, you know, like, like you and me. And so that's kind of a cool thing. I, you know, it's, it's something that uh, is a little bit counterintuitive based on how people are typically taught. So mm -hmm. I think it's a cool lab. And I did, I, I did remember um, when we did that one, uh, you, you had a really good image of the peas. You had like five little peas on a wet paper towel. And then you did this sort of day thing where like day one, this is what it looked like day two. And then about day three, maybe day, day three or four, they started, you know, they got a little bit bigger and then they started popping out little uh, appendages. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, what was, uh, the, they were called the radical. Is the radical. Right? Yeah. The radical and the cotyledon. Yeah. Oh, that's always fun. Uh, you know, turning in actual plants. Yeah. 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 Well, it's fun to like, I, we don't, I don't typically do that in the classroom because there's not enough time to really watch the seeds germinate. We just, we put them in water for, for our 24 to 48 hours before we do the lab. So the kids just see these round balls in some water and they just take them out and measure them. So I wanted to show that process of like the pea actually engorging with water um, and really hopefully talk about, well, what's happening inside that seed um, as the water gets inside, what's, what process is allowing those that, you know, the roots and the shoots to start appearing um, and how it gets the energy to do that. And so hopefully um, when I'm talking with my AP kids in two weeks, they'll be able to surprise me with wonderful answers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if someone wanted to try this at home, uh, what kind of peas would they need to purchase? I assume uh, you don't want to use canned peas since they're cooked. <laughs> you know, yeah, they're probably I've, germinate. Yeah, I've um, I've used a variety of seeds over the years. Um, I used I got these off of Amazon, <laughs> so like they're just Alaska peas. Um, and then I've no, I've used mung beans before. Um, really, any dry bean could work. Um, yeah. They might have different germination lengths or some other factors that go in there, but I think, yeah, but and nothing... that was actually in years past, I've had students when they are identifying different factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis, or I'm sorry, cellular respiration, they, some of them want to look for other seeds. So they'll bring in other seeds and germinate mm -hmm. other seeds and see how that compares to the, the peas that we're using in class. And so some kids have brought in pumpkin seeds to see if they could get them to germinate because it's usually around Halloween time, this time of year. Yeah. <laughs> that we're doing yeah, this lab. Cool. <laughs> so, so they've got, they collect some pumpkin seeds and then bring them in and see what they can learn from it, which is great. Yeah. Cause I mean, that's what you want. You want kids to make connections in their real world. So if they're looking if they're cutting a pumpkin open and seeing these seeds and saying, Oh, I wonder, their, their respiration rate. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. And then comparing uh, different species of, of, you know, plants to one another and the respiration rate between them. Yeah. If a kid, if a student's doing that on their own, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> From a uh, social media for a while and uh, let me go check out these peas, you know. <laughs> hey, they can yeah. put it on their TikTok, so it's fine. Oh, they <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's an incentive, uh, you know, to do that. In fact, you probably just started something with your students who are on. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it, but it's okay. I can always hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, another video that, that you did was um, you were exploring uh, population dynamics. And, you know, typically these kinds of things, you're looking at some sort of, you know, predator prey uh, model. Maybe it's like wolves and rabbits or something like that, or you know, whatever it might be, a predator and an herbivore. Um, in this case, you did something a little unique. You want to talk about that? <laughs> sure. Yeah. And that's kind of where I started thinking about this concept with the idea of like lynx and snowshoe hare population dynamics, which is a an, an example a lot of 
teachers use with their students of how the population changes. And I really wanted to kind of use some mathematical modeling with my students and compare logistic growth versus exponential growth. And I just wasn't finding what I wanted with the hair and linked um, examples. And so I was kind of going through some of my other activities I've done in the past. And one of my favorite TI STEM behind Hollywood activities was the zombie apocalypse. And I'm like, look, there's a perfect exponential and logistic growth model. And why don't I talk about carrying capacity when talking about zombies? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it just makes it fun. So I looked at that uh, example a little bit more closely and thought, well, if zombies are, you know, if we're, we're creating zombies um, and this, in the simulation, if people aren't familiar with, it's a virus that causes people to turn into zombies. And so if that virus is, have plenty of people to infect, it's going to be this exponential growth, <laughs> uh, yeah. exponential growth. Um, so I thought it would be a fun way to introduce um, carrying capacity um, as you know, the zombies run out of fresh humans to eat, they're, <laughs> they're going to yeah. reach that K, that carrying capacity. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if, you, if there aren't any people left for you to turn into zombies, then your, your zombie is going to go from going straight up to kind of leveling off there, I, I would imagine. Exactly. So I, I figured it'd be a fun way to, to showcase that. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually assigned yeah. that. Why didn't it? I, I sh shared that with my students in the beginning of the year, my one grade level biology students, we started with ecology. Um, and one of the first weeks we talked about um, carrying capacity of populations. Um, so I threw that video up for them to take a look at. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. No, I, I love that because it's, 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 you know, it's, it's out of the box. It's, it's a little different than what, you know, a typical biology lesson might be when it covers that topic. Um, it's something the students are probably going to be interested in, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so you're able to kind of take that engagement level and connect it to a real world topic that they have to know. Of course, zombies aren't real, but, you know, the, the concept behind how that whole thing works, that relationship between, you know, in this case, predator and prey, that is real. And, and uh, you know, there's only, you know, there are only so many animals that the you know, the predator can eat. And, and once you run out of those things, well, guess what? <laughs> you know, uh, your species might be in trouble. So it's, it's, no, it's a really cool topic. And also this time of year, I mean, it's October. Uh, so, you know, this is when we start talking about Halloween and, and, you know, monsters yeah. and that kind of thing. So that, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And zombies yeah, are one. still a hit. I like, I, I don't know what it is about zombies, but yeah. it's, still something that is very engaging to even students still so yeah. and yeah it's oh, october so it's right it's zombie season <laughs> it's zombie season that is a cool activity because there's a lot of cool math and cool science in it and i like how you adapted it for this particular topic i know um you know a lot of other folks are looking at if it's a math class they use it to talk about the difference between exponential and logistic growth um, and you can do some of that stuff even at the middle school level without getting into, you know, the actual functions themselves. But you can say, well, you know, look, it's the zombies are growing, you know, are, are they going to keep doing that forever? Well, why or why not? And then have that conversation with kids to say, well, because we're almost out of humans, you know, and, and you know, it becomes obvious when you when you talk to them about it. Plus, they're they're into it. So do oh, you absolutely. have zombie movies, Jessica, since we're talking about zombies? My favorite zombie movie? Is that what you yeah. want? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I'm really not into a lot of zombie movies. Yeah. If they're okay, I don't mind them, but I don't have a favorite. Yeah. There's I'm kind of disappointed that I can't give an answer for that. <laughs> nah, you're okay. I, I didn't like zombies until TI, we started working on that activity and then it was kind of homework and I'm like, yeah, oh, gross. Right. Uh, but uh, I did. Oh, it's so much fun. So much Yeah. Fun. And I did watch Night of the Living Dead, which is like the 19th. That's a classic. A classic zombie genre movie. I think it was like the first of the genre. Um, I don't know if your students would watch a black and white movie. So that's. Might. <laughs> I'll have to ask them tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they might not have heard of it, so. Yeah. But maybe maybe they'll surprise me. 
Maybe um, so. But you were mentioning about the graphs and the, the level of um, how you can adjust it. And mm -hmm. that's what I like about this lesson so much is because you can use it with a variety of grade levels from middle grades to even calculus. Like you can just talk about trend lines, like as you were saying, increasing like what's happening in this graph, looking at just what the graph is doing um, versus getting into the real math behind it and doing some calculus with logistic growth model and understanding limits and all sorts of fun stuff, which, you know, <laughs> my AP kids might start sweating <laughs> when we get, right. get the population <laughs> dynamic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when I show them the, some of the equations we use for that, they are like, wait, this isn't calculus. <laughs> like you don't need it. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, I agree. And, and um, I think, you know, uh, every teacher in the country right now is having to become uh, creative, especially, you know, in this, in this environment, I've heard of some districts where uh, the teacher is having to, to do both in-person and virtual uh, in the same lesson. So they're yeah. kind of calling in on, on zoom or whatever it might be. And then there's also kids in the classroom and the poor teachers trying to, you know, uh, do both for both. And, it, and it's a really tough situation for them. So um, if, if there's ever a year uh, for teachers to get creative, it's, it's definitely this one. This is a pretty wild year. Yeah, absolutely. Like teachers are, we're tired. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're really tired. Um, yeah. But we're doing the best that we can. And I think, you know, creativity and finding joy as much as you can in whatever you're doing. So, um, being able to talk about like those macro invertebrates and being able to talk about zombies um, yeah. just makes it fun. And if I'm having fun, the kids are having fun. That's kind of yeah. my philosophy. <laughs> yeah. So I pick topics that I, I know I enjoy and that, you know, it, in this environment, you know, I'm used to talking to my laptop now. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to entertain myself. Um, so I have to think about, you know, I'm here laughing at my own jokes, thinking like the students are laughing. I'm just pretending to myself that, oh, I can hear your laughter through this, uh, through my laptop here and just making myself think that like, okay. Yeah, well, you know, if they're not laughing at your jokes, they're probably laughing at you laughing at your jokes. So it's yeah. just like, mission accomplished. Just exactly, yeah, we're all having a good time, whether they're laughing at me or with me. So. <laughs> right, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I, I do think these videos that, that you created are, are going to help teachers across the country, biology teachers across the country, um, you know, just to give them something to point to and say, hey, you know, uh, students today, we're going to watch, you know, uh, Mrs. Kahoot do a, a lesson on, you know, biodiversity or cellular respiration or whatever it might be. I think this is a, these are great resources to help teachers out, you know, to help teachers um, with some, some really creative and, and dynamic content. So, I uh, just want to say thank you for that and thank you for, for making them available to, to all of those teachers that, you know, biology teachers specifically that can benefit from them. Well, that's awesome. Um, I know I have benefited from many biology teachers that have shared their work in the past. So if I can help anyone just a little bit, I'll be, I'll be very grateful <laughs> for that. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, uh, Jessica, I think we are just about out of time, but before we go, I wanted to, in case, I know there's students watching, so you may not want to share uh, any of your uh, uh, social media channels, but if, uh, if you did, um, this is a great time to kind of let people know if they want to follow you, um, if you want to let them know what, what your, uh, your social media um, channels are. Sure, um, yeah. I mean, I share it with them too. It's my teacher, so it's at MRS. K-O-H-O-U-T, so at Mrs. Kahoot um, on Instagram, Twitter, and even TikTok. I joined in the spring. I don't know why, but yeah. <laughs> my, my students encouraged me. I have like 10 followers. <laughs> hey, that's great. <laughs> yeah. You're way ahead of me. I'm still trying to navigate the whole social media world, so I'm a bit Yeah, behind. It's just a bunch <laughs> of like biology videos that most of them are like stream stuff and... <laughs> So. Yeah, I, you know, I, I bet uh, if, you know, if there are teachers uh, watching this tonight, if, if you guys want to follow uh, Jessica on those social media channels, I guarantee you there will be some really cool stuff there that uh, you can probably take advantage of. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, with that, I think it's uh, we're we're at six or well, we're at thirty minutes past the hour because it depends on which <laughs> time zone we're all in. But uh, I want to say thank you, Jessica, for the time tonight and and talking with me. And uh, uh, good luck for the rest of your school year. I have a feeling your kids are going to be in, in great shape uh, with you as their teacher. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we'll say goodbye. All right. Thanks, Eric. All right. Bye, bye Jessica. Bye, everybody.